Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Bryce Batts. She's an experienced career coach and recruiting manager with a specialty in AEC and the MEP trades. Bryce specializes in defining strengths and identifying weaknesses while setting goals for success. Welcome to the show, Bryce. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, looking forward to this conversation. Well, let's start with how you you got involved with AEC and construction industry. Yeah, well, I've been a recruiter as far back as I can remember, really. I've been recruiting uh, for over 12 years, off and on. I took a small break when my daughter was born. And my husband is also a landscape architect, but I met a friend of mine uh, when I was getting my MBA, and she was a recruiter for the AEC industry. Sounded really interesting, so I jumped in and I haven't looked back. Nice. Well, what's the current state of of hiring in the AC industry with all the <laughs> disruption that has taken place? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's pretty tough right now. You know, firms are still hiring. Two thirds of companies have open positions that they would like to fill with an, an ideal candidate, wow. and obviously turnover is still occurring. Um, you know, the majority of firms are saying it takes anywhere from 30 to 60 days on average to hire a candidate. And for those really difficult positions, the majority of firms say it takes five months or more. Um, so I think, you know, companies really have to develop a recruiting strategy that takes more of a proactive rather than a reactive approach to hiring. Um, you know, hiring from a position of lack once they have a project come in just puts them behind the eight ball, um, puts them at a real disadvantage. You, a better practice really is to develop a talent acquisition strategy uh, mm -hmm. that includes a continuous process of recruiting. So for those who may not be familiar with that uh, strategy, what all does that really involve to have that kind of ongoing process? Well, as a recruiter myself, I think it's great to uh, partner with other recruiters or career coaches in the industry. But another thing a, a firm could do is offer a referral program. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of my clients offer four to five hundred dollars for employee referrals. Um, companies should be tapping into their existing employees as ambassadors of the firm. And I read a study that showed employees hired from referrals come in 55% faster than those sourced through career sites. And then, of course, using social media, um, you know, consistent with previous years, firms are still reporting a lack of, uh, a lack of qualified candidates, um, which is the biggest impediment to successfully hiring new talent. Um, so there's really an increase on digital recruiting, you know, using LinkedIn, I think 87% of firms are now using LinkedIn as a method of recruiting. Mm -hmm. when you think about millennials and Gen Z now entering the workforce, they grew up with social media. So this is where they're going to look for jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, to be on the forefront of that. And then obviously highlighting company culture and perks, um, company culture is really important. Um, especially to those two demographics I just spoke about, both millennials and Gen Z, because they really want a flexible, creative, and uh, innovative workplace. They want customizable benefits, paid volunteer hours, um, signing bonuses, which you typically, you know, thought of only senior level management getting. Um, lower level employees are getting that now, and then flexible hours continues to be a trend. Uh, everybody's wanting more flexibility uh, in their work. Mm -hmm. uh, the social media aspect is intriguing to me. I, I'm a, uh, a slight addict on on LinkedIn, but uh, how would you in encourage or uh, suggest to, to companies to set up their their LinkedIn profile to be the most uh, attractive, if you will, to prospective employees? Yeah, I don't think it has to be anything difficult. If a company can just set up a LinkedIn page, if they can post their jobs there, and then everybody wants to see the fun things your company is doing. So if you can post pictures of company outings, uh, share success stories about your employees, and then have someone who's actively updating it 
um, candidates are going to see that and know you're active on LinkedIn, but also see the culture that you have to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So yeah. I've been hearing this term of the, the great resignation. <laughs> what is that? And then what's kind of the, the catalyst behind this? Yeah, well, I think the catalyst is COVID. You know, people were at home for a year or more and finally got quiet and figured out what they really wanted out of out of work and their what they wanted their week to look like. And so now you hear the term that's been coined the great resignation or the great reshuffle, which I heard it called uh, just a couple of days ago. You know, workers are quitting their jobs in the highest rates in 20 years. And um, I'm hearing that one in four are leaving their jobs. Um, so like I said before, I think employees are really in control now and they want more flexibility. Um, they don't wanna be doing that hour and a half commute each way or hour each way, however it may look. So I see a lot of companies either moving to fully remote, which can be really difficult for an MEP firm. It's highly collaborative. Um, or moving to a hybrid schedule, which I think will be more of the norm. Yeah. Uh, so with this great resignation, is it that people are just kind of shifting companies or are they leaving the industry altogether and, you know, popping up in a, a totally new field? What, what's, what's kind of going on with that dynamic? Yeah, I see more people just shifting companies. They're looking for a company that's going to offer what they want whether that's increased flexibility, increased benefits or pay, mm -hmm. which it seems now employers are willing to pay 10, 20% more uh, due to the lack of, of talent and trying to recruit. You know, I've heard of MEP firms who are now, it's September, they're hiring candidates or employees, interns straight out of college. So you know, when they're graduating next May, these interns already have a job lined up. Nice. Uh, so th this is kind of, I see this as a, a compounding problem, really. But with if one in four are, are leaving, we already have the well-documented skilled labor shortage in the trades anyway. So we're just getting kind of further and further behind. And then you have all the retirements that are, are happening at a, right. a very rapid and accelerated clip in construction we have to be able to tap into new demographics that the construction industry hasn't uh, yeah. been able to, to pull in, in in mass numbers so far. So what are things that you have found that are different aspects of construction maybe that are attracting people into the industry? Well, I think as employers or excuse me, employees are looking for new jobs. They're taking in a, into account the, the company culture they're also looking at the salary that's offered. Obviously that's a key factor, but benefits and perks as well. Um, they also want a clear career path. So they're wanting to know there is upward mobility. You know, and I think as the US workforce becomes increasingly uh, racially, ethnically and gender diverse construction companies need to be ahead of the curve um, and embrace diversity as well. You know, studies have shown that employees in a diverse environment are more engaged and happier than those who aren't. Um, and this is especially important in construction because it relies so heavily on uh, teamwork and good communication. Um, attracting diverse audiences, you know, requires the, the organization to really create a mission for that. Um, and employees want to work somewhere where they feel like they're being seen and uh, feel like there's people there that can relate to them and that they relate to. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, the trend lines that you're seeing with construction firms in addressing that? Uh, you know, maybe uh, you know some, some recent stories or, or something where people have, have really done it well? Yeah, I mean, I think putting um, some of the burden back on the employees uh, as far as employee referrals go, um, really looking to them to be ambassadors of the firm. Um, also, just creating a, a diversity committee within the company um, and performing culture audits. Another big thing, I've got some clients that do this, is surveying their current staff. Anytime they make an important decision, you know, they go to their staff and, and ask them what their opinion is so they feel like they're being heard. And I think that's really important to address um, issues through all levels of the firm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that that feedback loop is is important in a lot of things, but especially when it comes to uh, corporate culture to hear how things are are really being perceived and and operating in the the real world. It's it's one thing to think through how uh, management is, is going to think that this is going to be impacting, but it can oftentimes have a, a very different real world. Um, use case. <laughs> for yeah, it. I think it's so important for leadership to be asking the hard questions of their team. You know, if they want to hear the real answers, they have to ask the hard questions for sure. Yeah. And then take it an extra step further, not just ask the, the hard questions, but be prepared to respond to that yes. and take action about it. I think it's if you just ask the questions and then nothing ever changes, it's probably way more does way more harm than not asking the question at all, you know? Agreed, agreed. Uh, on the retention strategy, how, so, you know, a corporate culture, having a, a healthy one is, is important. I think we all can agree with that, but what are some steps that the construction firms can kind of put in place to help kind of go the, the extra mile and stand out so that when they have those employee referral programs, people are, are more willing to say, yeah, come work for this company. This is, yeah. this is a good one. Well, I think, you know, that's the bottom line. Your employees have to be bought in. Obviously, they're not going to refer their friends or anyone to the firm unless they really believe in what their company is doing. And so in terms of diversity, you know, I think it has to be diverse, both culturally, um, through gender and race. You want a company that's open-minded, um, but also companies that really can lay out a plan for uh, career development. So candidates coming in or new employees coming in know there's room for advancement um, and how long it's going to take to move up and what that career path might look like. So maybe those people can talk to other employees within the firm. Um, reputation is huge too, going back to everything being online a lot of new uh, candidates that are interviewing are going online to Glassdoor, you know, social media, talking to friends at the firm. And if they're hearing bad things, then they're not going to move forward with an interview or, you know, taking the position. Mm -hmm. um, I read a Bentley University study that said 95% of millennials say a company's reputation matters to them. Um, and 91% said a company's social impact efforts are really important to them. So these things, you know, truly matter to an employees and they want a company that embodies a positive mission and that they're and really passionate about it. And then back to work-life balance, of course, you know, it's an industry where long hours are pretty much expected, but it shouldn't be at the expense of your family or your life. You know, employers have to provide adequate time off for workers, whether it be personal days, vacation time, you know, more moving towards maternity and paternity leave, which is great. Um, you know, when I had kids, that was not a thing. I barely got any maternity leave and I know my husband got no time off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what are some ways or some things to be on the lookout for in order to help increase satisfaction for people? Well, I read a study recently that honestly blew me away. Um, it said the number one predictor, if someone is satisfied with their job, is their relationship with their boss. Well, <laughs> yeah, just goes you goes to show you how important that is. It, yeah. it said it's the number two influence on their mental health, and that seventy five percent of people said their biggest stressor in life is their manager. That's crazy. Yeah, except. I mean, I, I believe that it makes that big a difference because it's, uh, yeah. but that's, that's insane. So with, with that stat in mind, what, how, if you're a manager, <laughs> well, uh, what do you do with that stat? Uh, <laughs> I know, no pressure, right? Um, well, yeah. I think, you know, it's really important to have an open dialogue with your team. Um, I think everybody wants to be appreciated for a job well done. And um, in that same study, it said 65% of people haven't been given any appreciation from their boss. So I think it's important to hear when you've done something well, a pat on the back, just words of affirmation, something from your leader to know you're on the yeah. right, right track. And I think it can make a huge difference. 65%. 
don't get the words of affirmation. That's that's a yeah. crazy high percentage. Surely we can do better than that. No kidding. No kidding. Uh, yeah, I uh, am a big believer. Uh, I'll say the phrase, know the person behind the employee. And by that, taking the time to really sit down. And I, I want to know my team on, on who they are outside of work maybe even more than in the, who they are inside of work, because that's going to tell me so much more about them and help around them out. And right. really that kind of trust factor, then it, it helps the team become way more efficient and, and tighter knit, I think, uh, by taking the time to, to get to know who that person really is and what are their interests and passions. Exactly. And then, you know, too, when they're going through something and when they may just need a little grace that day. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, it brings the human element into it. Exactly. When, when you're trying to bring somebody into the industry that maybe doesn't have as, as much experience in AC or, or they're new to it entirely, what are some of the kind of selling points of the industry that, that you've found that people get excited about? Well, it's very hands-on. I think people are super excited about that, that they could actually design and build something and, and see it being built, mm -hmm. um, work with a team that's highly collaborative. Um, so if there's someone coming from a different industry into construction or, you know, or MEP even, um, if they have those transferable skills, obviously for some positions, you're going to have to have a degree, you're going to have to have a license, um, to sign and seal and things like that. But there are certain skills that are transferable certifications. They can get classes they can take if they're interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Well, one of the aspects that I find pretty unique and exciting with the construction industry is, you know, you mentioned the career development path that, that people want to know that there, there is growth and potential moving forward. I, I feel like construction offers a lot of flexibility in that for people to, to come in at the ground up and really kind of go several different routes, whether it's through an apprenticeship or they go into the office side or they learn the design on the software side of things. There's, there's a lot of different routes that, that people can take in AEC. Yeah, I love that. You can be as hands-on as you want to be, or if you want to manage people or projects, there's opportunities for that as well. Um, so I do think that's nice. You can kind of go where your interests lie. And as long as your company is on board and you guys can forge a plan together. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so you mentioned what the, the new model of uh, in office versus remote work is, is kind of going to look like. What do you think coming out as, as things start opening up? What's that balance going to start to really become? For, for most people that I'm talking to, they think the balance is really a hybrid situation uh, where they're in the office a couple of days, they're working from home for a couple of days, maybe they have flex hours, you know, core hours are six to six or whatever it may be, and they're coming in within a certain time uh, in between there, but I think they're just looking for some flexibility. I know a lot of people still want to work from home full time, I just don't know how feasible that is in this industry. Yeah. What kind of pushback do you think is going to be there from the people that, that want to stay remote and have proven that they can, they can handle their job remote? Yeah. Well, as a recruiter, we're definitely hearing a lot of that. <laughs> they want to be uh, remote full time. They think they've proved that they can do it. They're still successful. They're meeting deadlines. But I try to see the employer's perspective too. You know, if you're working on um, high profile projects and you're answering to a client who wants you there and the employer has felt like some things have slipped through the cracks or maybe not been addressed while yeah. everyone's at home, of course they want them back. I think employees are thinking that they can find a company that will cater to their needs. And if it's not their current one, they're going to look elsewhere and and that's what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from a employer perspective too, is it, uh, uh, have you seen people get excited by the possibility that they can, that they're not confined to specific geographies for talent? The, the whole world is, is their, their talent pool now is that what, what kind of wrinkle does that bring in, in recruiting? 
Well, I think it's a great opportunity for employers. If, if they've got employees working remotely, they can, you know, like you said, it opens the talent pool. Um, the wrinkle is if the policy changes and employees move and then they want them back in the office. And I'm seeing, I've seen that happen some where employees have moved states and then their companies have changed the policy. So now they're looking for a new job or they've already left and continue to look for a new job. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. And, but a lot of companies too, especially in AEC, have to have someone still doing site visits and things like that. So they need someone who's at least close to the area. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's, it will be interesting how, how it all continues to, to shake out the opportunity to be just more maybe intentional with how yeah. you're spending your time. And if do you have to go to the, the site every single time, or, or can you do some um, continued remote meetings and, and, and see that? And, you know, what's that balance going to be? I, I think it's a, anybody's guess yeah. <laughs> really <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Well, let's talk again in a year and see, see where things are then and what everybody's take on a hybrid work schedule or being remote is at that point. I, I think some people will get tired of being at home yeah. all the time, uh, for sure. But for others, you know, it might be the right thing for them. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Well, the, there's so many different variables in there and uh, different work situations of, you know, if, if you're you live by yourself and you never see anybody uh, maybe you're <laughs> you're itching to, to get out i uh i have three little kids in, in my house uh and so there's there's always noise and stuff i <laughs> i'm always seeing people yeah uh, so it's uh i think everybody's a little bit different on, on their tolerance level for I'm that sure. when they're when they're going to go kind of stir crazy and, and want to come back or something i've worked from home for the last 12 years so i was used to it but then when COVID hit, my kids were home, I have two girls, seven and 11. And then my husband, who works for an engineering firm, he started working from home. So then we had a very full house and my days yeah. were not quiet anymore. So it was a huge, huge shift for all of us. Uh, my husband had to set up his workspace in our laundry room because it was the only other spare room with a door. <laughs> <laughs> So I think everybody's just making adjustments and doing the best they can. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, my office is, is set up down in, in a windowless room in the basement <laughs> <laughs> when my wife's desk was, I could literally touch her, <laughs> uh, when we were sitting at the, the desk together, it was having to do video calls was, was funny. You were oh, yeah. very strategic with how you angle your <laughs> camera. You see someone just waving in the background. That's right. <laughs> you get, you learn to get creative though, you know? <laughs> It's true. It's true. Well, if you could innovate one aspect of this industry, what would that be? Oh, that's a tough question. One aspect. Oh, I think it's just being flexible. Like you just mentioned, I think uh, AEC for sure was not very flexible. Everyone had to be in office, you know, hours were super long, especially when you think of architects and meeting deadlines. And of course, it's a deadline driven business. But I think just embracing that flexibility and the um, the, the ability to pivot when needed. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting there because we've been forced to. Yeah. Are you feel like you're, you're seeing that kind of mental shift turn in, in companies? I am. It's interesting because I've had some clients say to me, everyone did well at home. There's no need to bring them back. And then others that said it did not work for them. So I really think it's company specific and also depending on the area that they're in geographically. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you notice any kind of similarities between the companies that it, it worked well for and the companies that it, it didn't work well? I think the larger cities, those uh, those companies have decided it's easier to have people at home. They uh -huh. were dealing with terrible commutes. You know, you think of people in Boston or New York or Philly yeah. driving an hour and a half each way and dealing with weather. So I think they honestly think they got more done working from home. Yeah. While some other states, it didn't work well. They prefer to be in the office. It, it is interesting. 
Yeah. That, uh, I, I can relate to the traffic. I'm, I'm in Atlanta. So my, my <laughs> oh, office yeah, commute, all about <laughs> that's right. It could literally take me anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour and a half to get to yeah. the office. It's uh, uh, you, you definitely get, I have, I have a lot more time to <laughs> uh, be in front of the, the computer than, than when I was going into the office. Yeah, and then you can work out. You can nap if you need to <laughs> take a <good> day shower. <laughs> That's right. You, you get a, a, a whole lot more uh, time back in your day for sure. Exactly. Well, how do people get a hold of you and, and find out more information? Well, I feel like I'm everywhere. Um, my web address is brycebatscoaching.com. I'm also on Instagram at brycebats and uh, LinkedIn, brycebats as well. All right, Bryce, last question for you. What does innovation mean to you? Innovation means constantly changing, being able to pivot, um, new ways of thinking. And so for the AEC industry, I feel like we're really seeing that right now. And I hope they continue to innovate, whether it's work hours or diversity um, or just how they look at work in general. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us, Bryce. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed it.